concerning the meaning or meaninglessness of the whole of human existence. Blinded by the astonishing success of the natural sciences, modern man has become indifferent to what the sciences themselves were indifferent to. As he put it, merely fact-minded sciences make merely fact-minded people. With no sense of the place of modern science in the long-run unfolding history of reason itself. Of course, history for someone like Husserl is nothing but the history of the unfolding of reason. And Husserl made the following plea to his listeners in 1935 regarding what he called the decisive question. Do not these questions demand universal reflections and answers based on rational insight? In the final analysis, they concern man as a free, self-determined being. But can the world and human existence in it truthfully have a meaning if history has nothing more to teach us than that all the shapes of the spiritual world form and dissolve themselves like fleeting waves? Can we console ourselves with that? Can we live in this world where historical occurrence is nothing but an unending concatenation of illusory progress and bitter disappointment? Well, there's lots in here, but for the moment I want to pick up on just one of its most clear, open, and ultimately most problematic assumptions, namely its conception of man as essentially a free, self-determining being. The conception of man as rational subjectivity. That conception of human life is not one among others. Indeed, it's the conception that informs the very sciences that so obsess modern man. Man pursues science and can grasp the objective truth about the world when he does so. And the reason why man can do this is fundamentally related to reason itself, to the possibility of freely determining himself to achieve a rationally grounded cognition of the world and genuine knowledge of the facts. The great masters of the philosophical tradition from Plato to Descartes to Kant beyond all subscribe to something like this view of man as rational subjectivity. Well, I'm going to come back to Plato shortly from an incredible moment in a philosophical text which incredibly helped through a performativity that we're yet to comprehend, which helped decisively to shape the whole intellectual tradition of Europe. But first I want to note with Husserl that none of these great thinkers supposed that the only form of rational cognition worthy of man was the exercise of theoretical reason, the pursuit of science. On the contrary, the classic view would be that there are various forms of rational activity and not all of them aim at empirical knowledge of facts. I'm going to list now, for the sake of brevity, a selection of candidate interests of reason. Because they're interests of reason, they'll be specifically human interests. All of which, those who cleave to a conception of man as rational subjectivity, might regard as worthy of man to pursue. So here are some varieties of rational cognition. I'm calling them cognition, but in any analysis, it would be totally misleading to think that what they're aiming at is to be modelled exclusively on the idea of knowledge of fact. But we could return to that. The use of theoretical reason. Here we'd have the science case. Rational cognition of the world leading to knowledge. Practical reason. Rational cognition of right action leading in the ethical sphere to moral knowledge and in the commercial sphere to economic knowledge. Aesthetic judgment. Rational cognition of the beautiful and the sublime, leading to aesthetic knowledge. Religious faith. Rational cognition of the supersensory, leading to knowledge of God. And pure theoretical reason. Rational cognition of the essence of the world, leading to wisdom, philosophia. Now, for the moment, Let's suppose, concesso non dato, that man is indeed, in the final analysis, as Husserl puts it, a free, self-determining being. If this were true, what would be the optimal conditions of human flourishing? 
what would be those conditions in which man can most fully realize his being as a free, self-determining being, or as rational subjectivity? Are these questions capable of being given answers based on rational insight, as Rousseau supposes? Well, although I don't think it's restricted to what's called political liberalism, for reasons that will emerge shortly, I'm going to define what I'll call classical liberal thought as offering a positive answer to this question. The classical liberal response to Husserl's worry that I'm envisaging passed through three steps. The first step is that a satisfactory account of the conditions of human flourishing must acknowledge the varieties of rational cognition just outlined. Or to put it differently, classical liberal political thought aims to optimize opportunities for free performance in different domains of human life connected to the different interests of reason. And these domains of human life, we can, I can, we can now map on to these varieties of rational cognition. I'll call them domains of devotion. There would be a theoretical domain, that part of your life lived in devotion to knowledge and wisdom. So that would take in the pure theoretical reason as well. Knowledge, and on the classical conception, this would be uh, conceived in terms of an opposition between knowledge and ignorance. In the economic domain, that part of life lived in devotion to wealth creation, here, the, distinct, the governing distinction was between profitability and non-profitability. The political domain, that part of life lived in devotion to a community. Carl Schmitt would tell us that the dominant distinction here is friend and enemy. The spiritual domain, that part of life lived in devotion to God. Perhaps fundamentally a matter of good and evil. The artistic domain, that part of life lived in devotion to beauty, the distinction between the beautiful and the ugly. And finally, a domestic domain, that part of life lived in devotion to family, love and hate. Now the first five of these, or all but the bottom of them, <coughs> say, are domains that are usually regarded as part of the public sphere. The last is the private sphere. Classical liberal thought has been, we should note, distinctively gendered, as indeed my discussion up to this point has clearly shown, distinctively gendered with respect to the analysis of rational subjectivity. Women's proper interests are supposed to belong almost exclusively to the private sphere. The second step in the classic liberal response is that political power should aim to organize the social world in such a way that each person's capacity freely to perform, if and where proper, in each of these domains is optimized. One could imagine the classical liberal seeing all sorts of conflicts there, all sorts of trade-offs, efforts to strike a balance between incommensurable ambitions and desires, and the sacrifices one might have to make in pursuit of one's chosen interests. There will also be questions about what assistance in all this should be provided for by the state. What can be left to an individual or collective initiative beyond the state? Perhaps with, with state regulation, but without state ownership. And then a third step for the classic liberal is that history is the movement of increasing success in realizing such a society. It's the movement of the emancipation of rational subjectivity. Purcell's remarks about the worldview of modern man suggest that what I'm calling the classical liberal <clears throat> view is in crisis. Suddenly the movement of our history seems not to be taking the path we thought we were on. History seems no longer a sequence of increasingly congenial spiritual worlds but a random series of worlds that, as Husserl puts it, form and dissolve themselves like 